Um, welcome to the FN Cares uh, Spring Panel Discussion on National Crime. Thank you all for coming. My name is Melissa Britton and I'm a settler, scholar, and filmmaker situated in Treaty 6 territory in the Miskwachi, Waskaikan, Beaver Hills House, Edmonton, Alberta. I'm honoured to work as the research associate for the First Nations Children's Action Research and Education Service. FN Cares is a partnership between the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society and the Faculty of Education at the University of Alberta. Today, I'll be introducing speakers and moderating the Q&A session. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the horrible news from Satellite Cree Nation yesterday. Um, they're estimating 169 potential graves found at the former Blue Quills uh, Residential School. Um, so our discussion, as you know, is going to focus on the national crime of genocide of First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples and how we must continue to hold Canada accountable for ongoing injustices. We understand that this can be very difficult discussion, especially for survivors, um, including intergenerational survivors. So please take care during and after the event. Um, I'm posting um, a support number. I've already posted a support number in the chat. Um, so if you're a survivor and you would like emotional support, please um, contact that number if you don't have anything else available closer to you. Um, uh, now, if you need to know how to get to the chat, you just go to the bottom of the screen and you're gonna click on the little box that um, says chat, just so for people who may not know that. So the order of events today is, first of all, we're going to be hearing from Cindy Blackstock. I'll just uh, briefly introduce speakers prior to them speaking. Then we're gonna hear from uh, power team, John Malloy and Amber Johnson. And then we're gonna hear from another amazing, incredible team, um, Ian Mosby and Eva Jewell. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Cindy Blackstock. Uh, Cindy is a member of the Gitsan First Nation and is honored to serve as the executive director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society. She's also a professor at McGill University School of Social Work. She has over 30 years of experience working in child welfare and Indigenous children's rights and has published more than 75 articles on topics relating to reconciliation, Indigenous theory, First Nations child welfare and human rights. Welcome, Cindy, and thanks for being here. Thank you. And uh, I join you all from unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin territory here in Ottawa. Um, and I really just want to uh, thank you all for coming to learn, especially because the children in the unmarked graves are really awakening Canadians to our responsibility to learn from the past so that we can address the contemporary injustices. It's not enough just to learn. It's not enough just to listen. We actually have to learn from the past and address the solutions that are on the books to, make, uh, to address contemporary injustices. So this man, uh, Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce, who you can see behind me, actually came to my kind of awareness uh, through John Malloy's book, who uh, John Malloy will be, is a historian, he'll be following me. But I want to really acknowledge his book, A National Crime, that tells the story of residential schools from the perspective of Canada's own documents. And what I found so interesting in reading that is I have always looked at the multi-generational effects of residential school in my own family and community and wondered, there had to be people back then who knew better and who spoke out about this. And Dr. Bryce is an example of somebody from that period who stood in contradiction to government policy. And what's so interesting about him is he was of the government. He was a bureaucrat himself. And so I wanted to say, share why his story is so important and confronting some of the myths we tell ourselves that I think stop most people in Canadian society from really learning from the past. But before I get in there, I just want to talk about colonialism. And there are a lot of definitions about it. And most often we think of the taking of lands and resources as colonialism. And of course that is. Uh, but the type that I think that is really at essence here is invisible colonialism. It's how um, states will use propaganda 
and uh, different types of things to shape the narrative and the relationships between First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples and the rest of Canadian society. And when we look at the kind of the taking down of monuments and all the rest of that, um, what I often hear is, well, they're, they're doing canceling of history, or uh, we also hear the phrase whitewashing of history. Well, what I find is that when we go back in history and we actually look at some of these wrongdoers and we put them in their context, we actually find uh, the people who stood up against them are the ones who are being erased. So it's not really whitewashing of history, it's rightwashing of history. And that's what I, I think Dr. Bryce really, really helps us get to. So one of the, uh, the, the when we saw the children in the unmarked graves, uh, particularly after to Kamloops and Cowessis last year, it struck a nerve in Canadians. Even though survivors had told their truths, historians like John Malloy and Amber Johnson and others had documented the children in the deaths before the TRC report, but seeing the markers in the graves made that truth un, you couldn't turn away from it. But we heard a lot of narratives from the government about this is a dark chapter in Canadian history. At the same time, I'm literally in court with the Canadian government because the Canadian government is fighting to continue its long-standing pattern of providing inequitable services. So this is the disconnect that often happens between residential schools and what's happening today. And what uh, Ian and, and Eva will remind us is that the survivors told their truths to, in many cases, stop the harms from happening to, to their grandchildren. And that's why the top TRC calls to action all deal with remedying inequalities to children. So what do we have to learn from history? Well, number one, we don't know how all those children died in the graves. But we do have enough information to say that they, many of them died unnecessarily. The governments and the churches knew they were dying at the time, and they also knew how to fix it. And here's the other thing, the public knew too. Newspapers were covering this back in the day. People were outraged. But the problem was, is when the headlines died and that outrage died, Business as usual continued to truck along in these genocidal camps. And this is a lesson of history we haven't really changed because when we think about to Kamloops and Cowessis and the big outpouring of support, well, now when we see children in unmarked graves being revealed in the newspapers, it's a brief story and then it gets lost in the headlines. And that's exactly what governments want us to do is look the other way. These are some of the headlines from 1907 that uh, really, uh, if in, in many ways, we kind of think, well, back then they mustn't have told the story very bluntly to the Canadian people. I think if anything, while we have this debate uh, around whether it's cultural genocide or whether it's genocide today, in some ways we're using softer language to explain this thing than they did at the time. This is a headline from the Victoria colonist in 1907. And it says, Indian schools deal out death. Startling rate of mortality is shown in report to the department, 25%. And then in, in a telling piece, we see this, this um, Bryce starting a reference to Dr. Bryce's report, where he was sent out as chief medical health inspector of the Indian department in 1904 to survey the health of the kids in the schools and found they were dying at 25% owing to the unequal healthcare funding and terrible health practices in the schools. Now, when the, the report goes out, yet the government doesn't react. It chooses not to react. It doesn't fail to react. It chose not to react. Mm -hmm. And here we have this article in the Toronto paper saying, his, his being Bryce's report is printed. Many people will scan the title of the cover some will open it and a few will read it. And so the thing will drift along for another year. And so with the next year and the year after, such will be the course of events, the protest of medical officers buried in blue books and the complaint of missionaries lost in pigeonholes, 
unless public opinion takes the question up and forces it to the front. And this is the lesson that we really need to learn. You know, I think about the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls calls to justice. It's been three years since that report. Not a penny in the last federal budget. Mm -hmm. So here's another headline. This one is from the Ottawa Citizen, right? And I really want to credit John because he basically taught me all this stuff about Dr. Bryce and these different characters. But here's a quote from, what, from uh, a lawyer of that period. You know, we heard dialogue when the, uh, after in the wake of Tecumloops about holding individuals responsible. But the question was never seriously asked as to whether the states, whether the Canadian state and the churches ought to be held criminally responsible for their behavior. And you can see here, this lawyer is wondering exactly that. And again, the headline is on the front page, right? It's above the fold. Back then, that's how you got your news. Those were the most shocking headlines were placed in that placement. It's not in the back pages in a small part in the newspaper. So this is the man. And I think it's important we spend some time talking about him because he's not some backwater doctor. Far from it. He was the Ontario's chief medical health officer. He was president of the American Public Health Association. And, um, you know, he's, he, he comes forward as a, from this tradition of bureaucracy and actually, in some ways, I think, believes in the system. And that's why I think he's so shocked that when he brings this to the attention of the government that they choose not to implement this stuff. And yet he does not remain silent. He continues to speak out. And for that, he's retaliated against. Uh, but and eventually pushed out of the public service when in 1922, he published it as a national crime, which John's uh, wonderful book takes its title from. And the national crime then results in another burst of media, where he recounts all of his efforts to try and save these kids lives. But again, the head, there was there was outrage, but the headlines died and then so did the children. And then what the Canadian government did is they made sure this guy was completely obliterated from history books. If you were, um, you know, uh, studying medicine, you would have learned nothing about Dr. Bryce. But this guy, the guy that, you know, who is heading up the residential school files, well, I, I knew him as early as a teenager. He was introduced to me uh, in Canadian literature. We had to study his poetry as a Confederate poet. And I thought his poetry was terrible. It was clearly very racist, but no one talked about his day job. I had no idea about his day job until many years later, right? He's hired by John A. McDonald himself, and he rises quickly through the bureaucracy to become superintendent of these schools. He absolutely does not dispute that the children are dying, nor does he dispute the fact that um, the, there's things that could be done to save them. He just simply chooses to, in a very perfunctory manner, not implement the most serious of reforms that could save the kids. And for this, he's rewarded, right? Um, as uh, John and Amber have taught me, uh, he even wrote to Laurier, Prime Minister Laurier, when he was stonewalled by Scott, how Bryce did. Uh, but that didn't result in any kind of major changes. And this guy became, becomes president of the Royal Society. But I'm calling your attention to the block on the upper left, which is um, in the wake of Tecamloops, had you gone onto Parks Canada website to learn more about this guy, you would have found that he's listed as a personal and national significance. I do not debate that, he absolutely is. But not for that reason, advocacy and education. That's how he was listed as in the wake of 2021. It was only after when that got to the media that Parks Canada blurred that piece out. But I had written to them three years before to say, you have to change this. This doesn't make any sense. I'm not a historian by training. I'm just a citizen who um, you know, thinks that people deserve reliable information. Again, from John's book. It's not, he wasn't the only one raising the alarm. There were letters going in. Uh, this one received by Scott himself, from the kids, from others. So all of this is to say that 
People back then knew better. The government knew those children were dying. The churches knew those children were dying. There were solutions to fix it. They chose not to do it. It reaches the national media. We get outraged or our peers, our ancestors get outraged. Then the story dies. I don't think that's much different now. When we see the pictures of people with, well, without water or in the case that I'm involved with in at the Human Rights Tribunal about the unequal treatment of children, that unequal funding for uh, First Nation services is the same issue that Bryce tried to correct over a hundred years from now ago. And yet it's still lingering on. This is a speech given by Gary Gamble, a former Indian Affairs employee who was fired in 1958. And he's talking about the different strategies governments use to steal Indian rights. And that first one on it, there's about 20 of them. Um, but this first one is so contemporary. It's the be patient speech. It's like, it, and the thing about the be patient speech is it's always given by those for whom no sacrifice is asked. They are the ones with clean water, with the equitable funding for their kids. Those are the folks with good housing. They're not experiencing the discrimination. The, the be patient speech is given by those people to First Nations in the wake of these inequalities. And the invitation is to not only allow government at its own pace to remedy these harms, which is basically never, but to also uh, you're, is to be thankful to them for the good work that they're doing on your behalf. We see this in the boil water thing. I think it's so interesting with the boil water advisory that the target in the public is to get rid of the long-term boil water advisories. Why? Why is that the target when for everybody else in the country, it's about turning on the tap and getting enough water to drink, to bathe, to cook with? Shouldn't that be the standard? And why should we all be thankful that water is being provided? That's a basic human right for everybody else. It's not reconciliation in Toronto when you remedy as spoiled water supply and actually get the water running. So these are the types of things that I think <clears throat> for me is a part of the history telling. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just recovering from a bit of a cold. <coughs> so <coughs> with Dr. Bryce, he was buried in Beechwood. And I went to see him <clears throat> the day before the prime minister apologized for residential schools. <clears throat> and there was nobody there. His family would have gone to see him, but he was forgotten. <coughs> and over the years, we um, saw historical plaques going up and thought something needs to be done for Bryce. <clears throat> so I reached out to John, to Marie Wilson, to others, and to the cemetery. And we erected with the Bryce family a plaque, a historical plaque for Bryce, but also gifted all the historical research and went into that plaque to educators to create curriculum for children. The more controversial thing was Duncan Campbell Scott buried over the hill. He had a plaque and it was glowing, very much like the Parks Canada thing. And uh, with the question was, how do we do truth telling there? Unlike with the monuments, you just can't take them down. So we had to do a balance telling of it. <coughs> history. One that gave due weight to the various legacies he left. So on that plaque is Confederate poet and cultural genocide on the same plaque. And I think that this is, a, you know, a, an important example of how you actually work with historians, credible historians, to really educate the public. This Reconciling History Tour is now gonna to be extended into the headquarters of residential schools, which of course is the city of Ottawa. 
And I think it's important that we continue to really establish these educational opportunities for the public in a way that helps them learn from the past to address the contemporary context. Because if we still adopt the dark chapter narrative, then we miss to be the great gift of history. And so uh, this is Dr. Bryce's grave. And uh, it is now one of the most visited in Beechwood Cemetery. So you can go and check it out and uh, learn uh, more about reconciling history in the uh, piece that uh, Melissa has, uh, the link that Melissa has put into the chat. And with that, I wanna turn it over to the real historians, the people like John and Amber and Ian and Eva, who have really helped me uh, do it. Hopefully I didn't embarrass them too much and get too many of the historical facts wrong. Um, but they have been such great mentors to me and really have encouraged me as a, as a novice, as an enthusiast of history, to really learn about it and to use it in, in ways that make a difference for kids. And John was actually an expert witness in our CHRT trial. So you can check out his amazing testimony on um, We Can't Make the Same Mistake Twice by Ellen Nisa Bomsawin. So thank you for that. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much. That's so great. I love um, you talking about uh, the gift of history. So many people just want to not even look at it. And I think to think of it as a gift and, and that we can look back and we can learn from people and see that people knew, but, and some people did something and what is it they do? We can learn strategies. We can open, open our minds and our hearts to that past and it is a real gift, and, um, and so are you. <laughs> um, next, we have um, Dr. John Malloy and Dr. Amber DVA Johnson, and I'll introduce them separately, but they'll be uh, tag teaming here um, for their presentation. Dr. John Malloy has completed foundational historical investigation in Indigenous settler relations. He's the author of A National Crime, The Canadian Government and the Residential School System, 1879 to 1986, based on research conducted for the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. He was an advisor to the Working Group of Church, Indigenous and Federal Government Representatives that laid out the foundation for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And he subsequently served as Director of Research at the TRC. He has also been an expert witness and researcher for law firms conducting litigation on behalf of First Nations communities. Dr. Malloy was Master of Peter Robinson College at Trent University and was the Director of the Frost Centre for Canadian Studies and Indigenous Studies at Trent University as well. He continues in that centre to supervise doctoral students and is now Professor em Emeritus of Trent's Department of Canadian Studies. Uh, welcome, John. And I'll just introduce Amber as well at the same time. Uh, Dr. Amber DVA Johnson is a researcher, educator, and a practicing fine artist. Her dissertation research focused on Indian residential school memorialization, and I'll post it later. It's uh, titled The Darkest Tapestry, Indian Residential School Memorialization at the Keeping Place at Fort Capel, Saskatchewan. Dr. Johnson has worked as an historical investigator, instructional designer, researcher, curriculum developer, subject matter expert, and as a college professor. She was recently appointed as a core member of an expert advisory committee to provide advice and guidance to Indigenous Services Canada, the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, and the Assembly of First Nations. Dr. Johnson and Dr. Malloy recently co-authored A Cruel Kindness, laying the foundations of federal child welfare welfare policy in the 1920s and 1930s. Welcome, John and Amber. Thank you. <clears throat> I think John has to unmute. There you go. Did I do what I was supposed to? Yes. Ah. And then I'm supposed to shut up because I think you're supposed to talk. What John and I have decided is that we we prepared a, a a paper that I'm going to read, and then John's going to make some 
rather pithy concluding remarks, I think is what we decided on. Pithy. Oh. Oh. Uh, alrighty, starting. So in 2005, Dr. Malloy gave a speech at Reconciliation, Looking Back, Reaching Forward Conference in Niagara Falls. We believe this speech explored a question that is still pertinent almost 16 years later. How, did, how do bad things happen when good people have good intentions? Uh, and, I, and I'm going to provide an excerpt from his speech. Doing good is apparently better than doing nothing well. And so hangs the tale of the residential school system and the child welfare system too, which can only ever afford child protection, removal of children from their families, rather than prevention activity, building up families. Those good people constantly lobbied for better funding, but rarely made any structural critiques. And thus they became fellow travelers of the system they did not approve of and earned the ill feeling of those whom they delivered second class service. As mentioned previously, we, we were, and we're all still talking about it because of today's discovery as well. Interest in the history of the residential school system has undergone um, a sort of revival. And this is connected, of course, to the discovery of mass graves at various sites at residential schools across the country. The resulting reactions of Indigenous and settler Canadians range between feelings of sorrow to feelings of loss and anger and rage. As scholars of the, of the Indian residential school system, we have been asked on numerous occasions, how could this happen in Canada? The answer is never simple, and the sources are multifaceted. For many settler Canadians, it is common to believe that discrimination, systemic or otherwise, against Indigenous peoples is a thing of the past. Rowan Savage has written extensively about the stolen generation among Australian Aboriginal populations, and he stated that the denial of wrongdoing and lack of acknowledgement of racist and discriminatory policies are actively maintained by settler societies as a method of preserving authority over indigenous populations. Furthermore, the lack of acknowledgement or responsibility for discriminatory policies can be directly connected to the survival of settler identity. He states that its legitimacy can only be maintained by denying it that any attempt was made to carry this out, this double bind, this necessary knowing and not knowing at the same time. Maybe the source of frustration settler society expresses at the very presence of Aboriginal Australians. In the Canadian context, Indian residential school history and the role of the schools has been formally acknowledged. And although the federal government has pledged to build a new relationship with Indigenous peoples, it has constantly dodged responsibility for the state removal of children from their families and communities. Furthermore, it has not been specifically acknowledged that the child welfare system has a higher overrepresentation of Indigenous children that replicated residential school dynamics by a factor of three. When it comes to the settler role in the IRS and CWS systems, there is often more information available pertaining to many elite department bureaucrats, including Duncan Campbell Scott, recently, more recently, Dr. Peter Bryce, and others such as Hayter Reed and less concerning the motivation behind the involvement of lesser agents in the system. Our report, A Cruel Kindness, aimed a spotlight on the evolution of the policy that was established and the resulting influence on the motivations, reactions to, roles of individuals working in that system. Significantly, reports from staff members, including teachers, principals, matrons, were not well known in the scholarly record. We can once again ask the question, how do bad things happen when good people have good intentions? It is clear from many reports from IRS staff that many found faults in the running of the schools, the consistent lack of funding, and the constant neglect of Indigenous children that resulted in a high death rate among school populations. In many media reports and publications, school staff have been called evil. They've been called uncaring and abusive. If we, blame, if we place blame on the design of the system, will it help us to understand the faults of the agents of the department, church, school administration, and staff members? Therefore, if we, accept, if we examine the rationales of the system, they are unmistakably linked to capitalist and colonialist efforts by the Canadian federal government to control and govern Indigenous peoples. Dean New and Richard Theron in their work, Accounting for Genocide, Canada's Bureaucratic Assault on Aboriginal People, have considered this subject extensively 
They stated that relationships between indigenous peoples and governments are filtered and managed through a complex field of bureaucratized manipulations controlled by soft technologies such as strategic planning, law and accounting. Those government processes are firmly entrenched within the broader phenomenon of modernity, colonialism and genocide. During the era of the IRS system, there are numerous reports of abuse, unhealthy conditions and educational curriculum that failed to bring reform. In many cases, reports were made to the individual superior or to the department by Indian agents, as well as through personal correspondence. Seemingly, they fell on deaf ears. In other cases, individuals stayed at schools for years, knowing that the institutions were failing Indigenous children. How can we explain this indifference? How can we explain the disconnect that many staff members, including teachers, administrators, and agents, applied in their interactions with Indigenous children? New and Theron have stated that the system was designed to create a divide between settlers and Indigenous peoples. They quantified this in action, stating that, and I quote, a rational thinking human being operating within a bureaucracy is logically answerable to the administrative dictates of that organization. The functionary's gaze will inevitably back up the chain of command from which the directive has come. It is not outward to the end result, which is in someone else's official jurisdiction. If a person or persons happen to be the recipients of the logically directed action, they are not within the sphere of the functionary's observations. Thus, the actions are not clearly immoral or unethical. Morals and ethics simply do not logically or structurally enter the equation. Can this help to explain how the damaging policies of the IRS system could persist and become the foundation for the damaging treatment of Indigenous children and their families in the Canadian welfare uh, system. Linking denial to discrimination, finding the monstrous in the benign, addressing historical and contemporary settler denial, past wrongs against Indigenous people is the first step towards reconciliation. Chris Cunin's work, Colonialism and Historical Injustice, Repatriations for Indigenous, Indigenous People, addresses the importance of re reparations in the process of reconciliation. As Kaneen stated, there can be no effective reconciliation without addressing in a meaningful way the wrongs of the past. Denial of discrimination against Indigenous peoples has not faded from the ongoing relationship between Indigenous and settler Canadians on many levels. One only has to type denial of residential schools into Google to find a slew of articles declaiming any number of facts concerning the history of the IRS system in Canada. Interestingly, as we were preparing our cruel kindness report, we were approached by a group of IRS deniers who most recently claimed that the number of Indigenous children who died at residential schools and the rising number of unmarked graves are elements of a conspiracy created to demonize institutions that have been described as well-meaning. Even more significantly is the continued discrimination of Indigenous children who have lived and continue to live under the discriminatory policies of the Canadian child welfare system. The, recollect the recollections of IRS staff and their role in the IRS system was chosen as a subject of study for our report as we thought it was a significant analysis of the mindset of a wide range of settler Canadians. Those staff members who not only worked in the IRS system throughout the 20th century, but who had first-hand knowledge of the copious and documented negative and damaging events that often resulted in the death of Indigenous children and the enduring damage to the survivors of the system that continues to reverberate through Indigenous communities. It was interesting to note that such a high percentage of staff were able to separate themselves from the wrongs of the system and maintained that they only had good intentions underpinning their involvement in the schools. As New and Theron have pointed out in their examination of biased Canadian policies regarding Indigenous peoples, the main outcome of these bureaucratic technologies is to buffer the actions of individuals from their consequences. The comparison of staff reports from a school such as Shingle Point that had very little to report concerning claims of corporal punishment, sexual abuse, and high death rates against one such as Chubinocity is significant in the creation of a discourse surrounding the continuance of the denial of discrimination against Indigenous children in contemporary Canada. As previously stated, if discrimination continues against Indigenous children, are the reasons obscured or are they in clear sight? What if the damaging actions are subtle? and seemingly benign, 
and are disguised with words like welfare and care. As Johnson aptly pointed out in her analysis of Shingle Point staff, members and their relationships with Indigenous children, that they show good intentions, affection and awareness, but also the reproduction of deadly hierarchies through which in these interventions were carried out and obscured. She states that school staff acting as colonial agents inflicted the damage of colonization through kindly and well-intentioned methods. Johnson further states that colonial states sponsored reconciliation through a focus on the violent sexual abuse of children has dominated criticism of Canadian residential schools and shifts our gaze away from contemporary struggles of Indigenous peoples. By creating monstrous exceptions, it is easy to state that the atrocities of the IRS system were the fault of a few deviant individuals and not of the system itself. As New and Theron have pointed out, we witness the brutal sophistication and irresistible force of racism applied bureaucratically and rationalized economically at arm's length, working insidiously as psychological terrorism. The violence having been turned inward becomes a toxic and effective self-loathing culturally and individually. Can there be a more elegant violence than this? Therefore, the monstrous exceptions are not the source, but a symptom of a flawed system. It creates a disconnect, isolating historical colonizing policies from their contemporary counterparts. Reconciliation cannot be achieved if denial of the assimilating, colonizing, and culturally genocidal legacy and tenets of the IRS and CWS systems continued to be supported by government agencies. How can historical education create a bridge of reconciliation? Why are Can settler Canadians often so unable to understand how we can create a nation that is inclusive of Indigenous peoples? And importantly, what does inclusivity mean to Indigenous peoples? Canadian society has long touted values of tolerance and multicultural diversity as a part of our national ethic. As Wayne Worry, Worry, Worry stated, Aboriginal affairs in Canada are in a disarray. We need a way out of the morass, a, sign of, a set of signposts a rationale, a guide, not a liberal or neoconservative roadmap, but an Aboriginal guide that is both pragmatic and visionary at the same time. We need new ideas and new dialogue that will take us not only to a workable union between Aboriginal and mainstream Canadians, but also to an understanding of Aboriginal rights that is both satisfying to Aboriginal peoples and unthreatening to the rest of us. To better understand the possible future of equity, inclusivity, and reconciliation, there needs to be an understanding of the history of the relationship between Indigenous and settler peoples. In that regard, Roger Simon stated in his work, towards a hopeful practice of worrying, the problematics of listening and the educated responsibilities of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that there is a need for focused research concerning the schools, fearing that, and I quote, a public memory of residential schools that heavily relies on pathos to achieve its effect, risk diverting attention away from the nexus of government and institutional policies and practices that enacted and subsequently implemented residential school legislation. As a consequence, he continues, this can create a historical amnesia or colonial unknowing that allows settler Canadians to express sorrow and sympathy, sympathy as a response. They confirm their own humanitarian character and consequently end up feeling good about feeling bad. Ironically, this allows for a splitting off of any responsibility for the injury or the injured. And this is what must not happen in Canada or our collective history. Okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to move a little bit forward here. Okay. How can historical education create a bridge of reconciliation? How can instructors, professors, teachers, communities, and students understand and explore the history of colonialism in Canada and its enduring legacy? Interestingly, the meaning of reconciliation can be interpreted differently by each individual, settler and Indigenous. Why is it important to create safe spaces for meaningful knowledge sharing, memorialization, social transformation, and eventually decolonization? There has been a burden placed on Indigenous educators, communities, and individuals to share their history of traumatic events, such as experiences in the IRS and CWS systems. While this traumatic history has been generously shared and reports from the RCAP and Truth and Reconciliation Commission 
are readily available for access by all Canadians. Systemic discrimination against Indigenous peoples persists. How can we explain this? Significantly, the TRC, call, TRC calls to action, which will be examined in detail, have focused on first recognizing and addressing the legacy of colonialism. This could be part of the problem, as the focus on legacy of past wrongs disconnects the colonial past from the contemporary conditions that many Indigenous peoples face today. If we cannot face the source of the problem, it is exceedingly difficult to propose remedies to move towards reconciliation. As historians, and I quote John, we find ourselves walking backwards into the future. We see and study the events of the past and find links and connections to the present. We hope that this knowledge can help us learn from the past to prevent the recurrence of past injustices in the future. Historical education can serve as a bridge between the past, the present, and the future. It not only provides different ways of thinking about the past, but also knowledge and understanding of historical context. Non-Indigenous students of all ages can be provided with pathways towards taking responsibility for their roles as settlers so they can learn to listen and follow their Indigenous counterparts. And from there, I'll pass it on to John. Are you sure? Yes. Ah. Um, thanks, Amber. Uh, Amber is a, a first-rate research partner, to say the least. But I think that neither Amber nor I, nor indeed, I don't think anyone else, has truly looked at the fundamental problem, um, which, which has um, been focused, I guess, <laughs> increasingly around uh, unmarked graves, residential schools and justices and things of that nature. Canadian policy towards indigenous people, British policy before that was, um, to encourage, and with respect to residential schools, perhaps force uh, Aboriginal people to move from where they were culturally and spiritually to where they thought was a better place for them, which was to enter into a uh, full partnership, uh, full participation in, uh, in, in the growing Canadian society. You know, what we call assimilation, really. And what assimilation has been and continues to be is the enforced uh, establishment of a Western, and let me say, let me be honest about it, foreign culture brought to this country by forces that dominated, forces that were able to establish their authority, to marginalize other forms of governance, to marginalize other forms of spirituality, to marginalize Aboriginal people in every way possible. And then turn around and say, well, how can we make it possible for you to join us, you know, without saying, how should we ch change, excuse me, the culture and ideas that we brought to Northern North America? So there really can be a partnership between those people who actually own this country, uh, rule this country, took care of this country, most importantly, for centuries before the arrival of these foreigners uh, who forced themselves uh, and their authority upon the real residents and owners of this land. That question has never been asked. All we've said is we're gonna open a door for you uh, to become a member of Canadian society. That door, of course, for a while was residential schools. Then you come, out you go. And when you come out the other side, you're a full serving, you're a member, you're a Canadian like all others, which was a phrase that rang down the hallways of those schools and, and, and was at the forefront of the minds of Aboriginal, sorry, of non-Aboriginal social and political planners. There was some way we could convert these people from who they were uh, to who we needed them to be without realizing the fundamental uh, arrogance of that, the fundamental harm that that would do and did do and has done and continues to do to, to non-Western people, to Aboriginal Indigenous people, not only in Canada, but Indigenous societies that fell, uh, that, that, that fell at the, uh, under the mercy, quote unquote, of these foreigners who came in and established their own systems. Now the foreigners feel guilty. Now the foreigners uh, hear the stories of rest schools and now they find unmarked graves and they wanna know how and they wanna make it better without uh, talking about the fundamental problems. How do we live together 
uh, in a land, we'll call Canada or New Zealand or Australia, with full uh, respect for each other. Full respect for each other, I don't think is, 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 is represented by the government and the Western society saying to Aboriginal people, you're worth, you're, you're, you're worth uh, being a member of our society. You know, you've earned the right to be a Canadian like all others. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're sorry we, uh, we, we applied means to you uh, that have been cruel and hurtful, but we're not going to change our mind. There is nothing in Indian policy. There's nothing in the Indian Act. There's nothing in the, the, the approach of liberals or conservatives or NDPers or anybody else uh, that represents a, a fundamental questioning of the application of, you know, Western European democracy on this country. It's simply that you know we're willing to treat you individual people as 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 worthy of membership in Canadian society. You know, running for office, voting, uh, you know, paying your taxes, et cetera, and so forth. But it goes no further than that, right? Uh, and we see it poke its head up and uh, be maintained and unresolved in a whole series of bonfires. One of the most interesting one for me is, you know. Why can Aboriginal people not run their own educational system without some oversight by a province, without some questioning by a church? Uh, why do they have to live up to the standards that are our standards? Well, I can see it's realistic because if you want to work in Oshawa car plant, you better understand the physicality of, of metal and gasoline and all that type of nonsense and give up the silliness of uh, the idea, for example, that, uh, that, that uh, uh, trees and rocks and, uh, and, and other such natural phenomenon have spirits, have a life of their own, can think and move. Well, that's just silly, foreign, indigenous, claptrap. You must come along, you must adopt who we are so that you can become Canadians like all others. The damage that's going to do to you, the damage that's done to communities, well, we know about the damage. And we complain about the systems that uh, that, uh, that that evoked, uh, that uh, created that damage. But we don't ask the fundamental question: How can we stop doing that? How do we come to terms with real partnership? Right? What what is 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 uh, reconciliation going to look like if it just means we saying our sorry, we're sorry, and we do better to you in terms of you know funding schools or social welfare? Or, or all this nonsense. How indeed, not that it's not important to say the least, how indeed do we decide that we're going to have a, a, a dialogue over living together without one side being forced to give up who they are, who, what their beliefs are, and how they would like to see their communities move forward. We're not having that debate. I don't think we'll ever have that debate. And thus we're going to put, you know, we're, we're gonna stumble into the future as we've stumbled through the past. So there's my uh, extremely optimistic forecast for what has happened and what's going to continue to happen. Every time that there is some uh, articulation, right, of a uh, of a possible solution, it's 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 laughed out of the public conversation. I go back to the recommendations of the Royal Commission. Uh, and 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 the and the models of self-government that were talked about, you know, a parallel parliament uh, of of indigenous people on the one hand and the existing parliament on the other, uh, which when it came to issues which overlapped, uh, would be forced to sit down and work out uh, jointly acceptable uh, solutions to both sides. Well, that was just silly, wasn't it? And that went. Uh, that was never considered. In fact. Uh, there used to be people who counted the number of Royal Commission recommendations that were actually adopted, and they were almost none. There was at one point a, the, the, the talk about, I think, a, a national Aboriginal bank, and I think that way moved a, a step or two forward. But there was nothing that was adopted that threatened the existing hegemony of, of uh, imported uh, political, social, economic systems, uh, and and their uh, their uh, including whether they wanted it or not, the indigenous the indigenous population. We haven't given one inch uh, 
uh, in terms of accommodating the other. And that's one assumes the basic fundamental first step to reconciliation, that we have to recognize these other people and we insist upon arranging a relationship which is healthy to both sides. Now, the problem with that suggestion on my part is it takes effort. It takes thinking. It takes, uh, uh, you know, an incredible amount of cooperation and conciliation. And we can't do that because the solutions to those problems are left in the hands of politicians. People whose, you know, whose, whose uh, vision is limited to the next election and limited to what they assume is the, uh, the opinions of the people who have elected and put them there. They don't rise above those practicalities. They don't rise above those minimal expectations. They're not daring, right? They're not going to lift us up and get us into any sort of reconciliation based upon mutual recognition and respect between the two cultures. So that's my optimistic conclusion. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Miller. I think it's a really good segue actually into um, Dr. Mosby and Dr. Jewell's talk in terms of accounting and holding government accountable and keeping track. Um, so I'll just um, get right. Thank you so much, both um, Amber and John for your presentation. Um, for those of you um, participating today, um, could you please enter your questions for the speakers in the Q and A uh, for the Q and A in the chat session, and we'll have time for a short Q and A after our next uh, team speaks. Um, so I'll introduce them now. Dr. Ian Mosby is an award-winning historian of food, Indigenous health, and the politics of Canadian settler colonialism. He is an assistant professor in the Department of History at Toronto Metropolitan University and co-author of the Calls to Action Accountability Status Updates on Reconciliation for the Yellowhead Institute. And Dr. Eva, Eva Jewell, uh, pronouns she, hers, is uh, Nishinaabekwe from Deshkan Zibig, Chippewas of the Thames First Nations in Southwestern Ontario, with paternal lineage from Oneida Nation of the Thames. Dr. Jewell is the research director at Yellowhead Institute, which is a First Nation-led policy think tank. She's also an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Toronto Metropolitan University. With Dr. Ian Mosby, um, she co-authors the annual Calls to Action Accountability Status Updates on Reconciliation for Yellowhead Institute. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the speakers today. Um, and I just want to thank everyone who's who's taking time out of their day to to listen to us talk. It's a it's a real honor uh, to be on this panel. And I'm really grateful to be speaking to you from the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit on lands governed by the Silver Covenant Chain and Dish With One Spoon Treaties. Um, now, Eve and I are going to talk to you today about our work trying to track Canada's progress towards completing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 Calls to Action uh, through the publication of a series of special reports for the Yellowhead Institute over the past three years uh, that, were just, that were just introduced. And I think it's important that as we commemorate the work of Dr. Peter Bryce, we don't forget, you know, as, as Cindy and as others have, have said, we don't forget that this work isn't done. Although the residential school system ended, uh, officially, it has, it's been replaced by other systems of oppression and harm, whether it's a child welfare system that racially discriminates against Indigenous kids, or a systemically underfunded education system, or a criminal justice system that does disproportionate harm to Indigenous peoples and families, Canada continues to be a country defined by systems of systemic anti-Indigenous racism. We're lucky to have modern whistleblowers like Dr. Cindy Blackstock fighting for Indigenous kids and families, but the systems of oppression that are currently in place require broad-based systemic changes. And this is where the calls to action come in. But I think before we can really understand why the calls to action are so important, we first need to understand their origins in the TRC. Now, I, I, I often wish that you know, all of this was self-evident and uh, I didn't need to start by making sure that we're all on the same page, but the reality is, as both Eva and I know from experience, that a lot of non-Indigenous peoples in Canada, and many, maybe many of the people watching this panel today, think that the TRC was something that it's not. The TRC was not, for instance, a process voluntarily undertaken by the Canadian government. 
In fact, it was residential school survivors themselves who insisted on the creation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission as part of the settlement of what was at the time in the early 2000s uh, had been the largest class action lawsuit in Canadian history. And it's a lawsuit, I should add, that um, Canada fought against tooth and nail backed by its army of Department of Justice lawyers. And even after the federal government agreed to the creation of the TRC through the residential school settlement agreement, their support was never a given. In fact, the TRC commissioners had to take Canada to court on multiple occasions because the federal government refused to release tens of thousands of archival documents related to residential schools. And these are ongoing, these fights for these documents. It was residential school survivors themselves then that drove the creation of the TRC. And over the seven years of its operation, more than 6,700 survivors recorded testimony of their heartbreaking experiences at residential schools. And it was this testimony that really formed the heart of the six volume TRC report, but particularly the 94 calls to action. So I want you to think about the calls to action then as an attempt by the TRC commissioners working on behalf of survivors to force Canada to address the legacy of residential schools and confront the reality of ongoing structural anti-Indigenous racism at the heart of nearly all Canadian institutions. Now, the, the calls are a first step then towards healing the wounds from a genocidal system that is still harming Indigenous kids and Indigenous communities to this day. So part of our goal then uh, with this project is honoring the work of survivors by trying to use the calls to action to make meaningful change in the present. And we're also motivated by our hope that the calls to action won't go the way of recommendations of previous Royal Commissions, like for instance, the Manitoba Justice Inquiry uh, or the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples uh, that John worked on. The fact that the vast majority of the over thousand recommendations made by various commissions struck over the past 30 years have not been completed by Canada highlights what's at stake. So the purpose of our project then is to make sure this doesn't happen with the 94 calls to action. Now, when I first started tracking the calls to action in the fall of 2016, I started because I was actually writing a talk about the TRC's final report and historians role in acknowledging uh, genocide against Indigenous peoples. And I was shocked to discover um, that no major newspaper or media outlet was actually tracking Canada's progress. And so I, I took, as you can see here, I took to Twitter, it was the only thing I knew, uh, and attempted to crowdsource a running tally of how Canada was doing. And the results you can see here are not particularly inspiring. These early efforts attracted a decent amount of attention um, and to Canada's lack of progress on responding to the TRC, but they're always limited by my own capacity working by myself and on a medium like, like Twitter. So I was heartened then when after a few years, a number of media organizations began more serious efforts to track the status of the calls to action. The most important of which was the CBC's Beyond 94 project. The, oh, sorry. The problem though with this and other projects that I quickly discovered is that they tend to give Canada way too much credit for even you know, announcing plans to start work on calls to action. You can see here, in progress, projects proposed. It looks like more work is being done than is actually being done. And this really started to hit home for me um, when the federal government itself started to use this rhetoric, pointing to their progress made on nearly every call to action, right? We've made starts on all the federal government's calls to action, despite the fact that they'd only actually completed just a handful and only those that didn't require any significant structural change. Now, Eva and I both started our jobs at what is now the Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson University. Uh, we started at the same time in 2019. And it was through conversations uh, and in talking about our joint frustration with the slow pace of Canada's progress on the calls to action. Eva was teaching a course, uh, which really focused on them and I was, I was doing this work. And we also talked about our shared problems with things like Beyond 94's methodology. Um, and so we decided to start to collaborate on a much more substantive, rigorous, and critical project of tracking the calls to action. So the result of that was three years of Yellowhead Institute special reports that you can see here, and I, I, I highly recommend that you, that you check out. Um, now, one of the things is Eva's background as a social scientist made a huge difference. Um, and we developed a methodology that foregrounded Indigenous expertise and that refused to give Canada credit for half measures. And so this meant increasingly we began to turn to 
uh, interviewing leading experts like Cindy Blackstock on child welfare, or Janice Forsyth on Indigenous sports, or Jas Morgan on arts and culture, Chris Statnick on justice and law, just to name a few uh, of the people we've talked to. And here's our most recent report, which I, I, I once again, I think it's in the chat, but I recommend that you check out. Now, the results of our efforts, um, as you can see here, have been pretty disheartening to say the very least. So by 2019, we found Canada only completed eight calls to action in total. And then in 2020, no new calls to action were completed at all. And then as you can see at the bottom of this infographic from our 2021 report, more calls to action were completed in three weeks following the discovery of unmarked graves at the Kamloops Indian Residential School than in the previous three years in total. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Eva to talk about what these revelations uh, over the past year have meant, both more broadly, but also in terms of how, you know, how it's changed the ways in which we view this project. I'll turn it to you, Eva. Miigwech, Ian, uh, Bujo Kinawea. Miigwech, everyone, um, for joining us today. I should mention I'm not a historian. I'm an Indigenous Studies scholar, specifically in Anishinaabe Studies, and uh, work in sociology. And um, so I'm going to touch a little bit about on the context that we speak in today. And that is in this moment in May 2022, that we live in a post revelations or a post Kamloops context. I really want to, I really think that's really important. The graves found outside of Kamloops Indian Residential School were not the first or the last to be revealed. And the announcement by Kamloops on May 27th, 2021 certainly created a renewed urgency around the conversation of reconciliation in this country, as um, Dr. Blackstock had noted. And it was known, as, as my um, colleagues here on the panel have said, that Indigenous children were dying in these schools at the time it was happening, as is, we can clearly see by Dr. Bryce's tireless advocacy in revealing the sheer amount of neglect and chronic underfunding, and not to mention the extreme violence in these schools that ultimately led to, ch to child death. And survivors too, of course, were vocal about this reality to the extent that the entire volume four of the TRC's final report was dedicated to missing children on marked graves. Indeed, numbers 71 through 76 in the calls to action deal with missing children and burial information. And the fact that former students of these institutions are called survivors rhetorically implies that many did not survive. Still, it seems that Canadians were broadly uh, Canadians more broadly were shocked, stunned, and in some cases in denial about these revelations and just the sheer amount of Indigenous child death that these institutions are responsible for. This signaled to me as an Anishinaabe person how much Canadians didn't know about these schools and how public education efforts are still failing. And so as this news broke, and remember it's international news, that urgency to rush to check in on the calls to action or the status update on reconciliation was truly remarkable. I mean, I, Ian and I were inundated with requests to speak about uh, reconciliation um, following and still do um, following the uh, announcement of more and more graves. And so I was curious and, and Ian as well, we were curious about the roots of that urgency. Why now? when there was ample opportunity to have implemented meaningful calls to action or even implement any of the thousands of recommendations that preceded the TRC. And we had come to realize that it's Canada's image that's threatened on the world stage. And when those secrets come out, interest in reconciliation skyrockets. In fact, we note in this last year's report that in the three weeks following the Canada's revelations, and again, that shocking blow, as Ian had said, um, of all the, the hundreds of graves that have come out, that there was a rush to fulfill the calls to action. More action in three weeks alone than, than the last three years altogether. And the calls selected for fulfillment that we note were not those that would substantially change or relieve the issues that Indigenous peoples live daily, as Ian had mentioned earlier. No, they're about responding so that Canadians have a space to reckon with these past acts. So the resulting creation of a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, changes to the citizenship oath, and of course the appointment of language commissioners for federal bureaucrats, which to my understanding had been in the work for some time, were all announced in those three weeks following the, the announcements in, in May, 2021. 
And still the revelations of those graves changed the landscape of reconciliation and added an urgency uh, to implementation of the 94 calls to action. And it was clear that the flurry of those completed calls was absolutely in response to international media attention and renewed public reflection on this country's culpability in genocide. The revelations of children's graves was deemed Canada's new story of the year by the Canadian press and the children who never came home um, topped McLean's 2022 power list of Canadians who are leading the debate and shaping how we think and live. So they're very much in the public imagination. So I'm thinking about the symbolic versus the structural calls to action. Uh, Canadians are compelled to ask whenever, you know, these types of urgencies of reconciliation arise again in, in media or in response to, to media, uh, they're compelled to ask what individual or even community level actions they can do to advance reconciliation. And I really do appreciate this work on the everyday level. And, and as Cindy had pointed out earlier, that it is really important to ensure that you're well educated or, or understanding uh, um, of, of what has happened and what continues to happen regarding indigenous relation or regarding indigenous issues in this country. Um, but, and it does take the work of all levels to enact reconciliation. And, and in a few slides, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about how Canadians are doing the work of informing themselves and, and being political, politically active is actually very helpful. But for the material changes to occur for indigenous peoples, the answer actually lies in the structural. The institutional and governmental level actions would make the most impact on ending colonial violence that indigenous peoples experience. This means there needs to be more political will to enact those substantial meaningful calls to action that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission outlined, particularly one through 42, the ones that would change um, the ongoing inequities that indigenous children are facing. And uh, in short, like many of the structural collective issues that we're facing today, like climate change, individual actions alone will not say solve this problem. They don't hurt, but they're not going to solve it either. But the good news is, and I'm reminded to always share the good news like Cindy, this symbolic implementation can lead to tangible results. Every year we have an opportunity on September 30th to reflect on the progress toward just relations between Indigenous peoples and Canadians. That means we can raise the expectations in this country to move toward meaningful reconciliation. So that means lifting the bar off the floor. So just being nice to Indigenous peoples or feeling bad, or feeling good about feeling bad about Indigenous peoples as Amber had mentioned is not enough. To enact the structural changes that many of the calls to action call for, it would result in tangible material change for Indigenous children and peoples in this country. Structural change has to occur. So Ian's going to talk a little bit more about the work we've done in deeply thinking about how to move from those symbolic gestures to the structural. And then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about the challenges to implementation. Thanks so much, Eva. And, you know, I think it's worth noting, you know, that at the heart of each of the sections of the legacy calls to action, these structural calls to action that he was talking about, are a series of very specific calls that outline the basic reporting requirements necessary in order for Canada to make any kind of measurable progress. You know, while we hope, for instance, that the appointment of a languages commissioner means we'll see meaningful reporting on the languages and culture calls to action, the same is definitely not true for calls to action related to child welfare, education, health, and justice. And so we'll just go through a few of these because they're really important. Call to action number two calls upon the federal government to, quote, prepare and publish annual reports on the number of Aboriginal children who are in care compared with non-Aboriginal children. Um, call to action number nine asks the federal government to prepare and publish annual reports comparing funding for education of First Nations children on and off reserves. Well, call to action number 19 calls upon Canada to establish measurable goals to identify and close the gaps in health outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities and to publish annual progress reports and assess long-term trends. And so finally, call to action number 30, once again, asking all levels of government to issue detailed annual reports that monitor and evaluate their progress towards eliminating the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in custody over the next decade. Now, I wanna ask all of you, what does it mean that Canada hasn't completed a single one of these crucial calls to action in six years since the TRC submitted its final report? It actually, said it's now seven years since they were released the calls to action. You know, without necessary data, how can we even begin to assess Canada's progress towards changing, changing any of these structural barriers to completing the legacy calls to action? And I think it's here that this really ties into the 
story of Bryce's national crime. Just as Canada attempted to suppress Bryce's reports on the health conditions of residential schools because they highlighted the brutality at the heart of the residential school system, Canada continues to refuse to hold itself accountable by <clears throat> actually looking at the ongoing structural racism that sees hugely disproportionate number of Indigenous kids in care uh, and Indigenous peoples in prison, while also guaranteeing worse educational outcome for children on reserves and racial discrimination whenever Indigenous peoples encounter the healthcare system. These facts continue <clears throat> to be shameful and continue to constitute what we both view as an ongoing national crime. Canada has the wealth and capacity necessary to complete all 94 calls to action, but I'd argue it lacks the willingness to make changes necessary in order to do so. And I think it's important to always remember, Canada continues to profit off of the dispossession and exploitation of Indigenous peoples, and all levels of government have proven themselves unwilling to meaningfully challenge the settler colonial status quo. And so I'll just turn to Eva to, to, to wrap up our presentation. And so picking up off of what Ian had noted, each year we were looking at the calls to action, looking at their lack of implementation, and we came up with just a short list on our ideas about what the barriers are to implementing the calls to action. Uh, in the interest of time, I like I invite you all to, to look at these in our special report um, in 2021, where we speak about all of these, John spoke about paternalism, um, that deep-rooted ongoing we know best mentality held by politicians, bureaucrats, and policymakers. But I really wanna focus on those uh, number three and number five. So the public interest where an apathetic Canadian public is the beneficiary of exploited indigenous peoples and land. We view this as one of a, a, a a major barrier to the implementation of the calls to action. Um, the federal government uses everyday Canadians apathy toward Indigenous peoples as a reason to not enact reconciliation and actually one of the arguments that they had made to um, refusing to pay out or to um, to follow the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal order that Cindy was um, was in court for was because it was against the public interest. It Again, Canadians are beneficiaries of an economy that violates Indigenous people's rights, which is why we uh, we don't see the re, uh, repudiation of the doctrine of discovery um, and, and some of those really core mythologies that form the basis of, of the Canadian state. And I wanna talk about number five, reconciliation as exploitation or performance. Reconciliation is at many times uh, has become an exploitative and paternalistic, colonial-minded attitude. Uh, and, it's, and that's used when approaching this work. And what results in this is this culture of exploitation and tokenization. And if you wanna read more about this in the context of museums and uh, cultural work, please read A Culture of Exploitation by Dr. Yaz Morgan. Um, and that is also available at the Yellowhead Institute site. Um, and so they wrote a, a brilliant report for, for Yellowhead Institute outlining the ways that reconciliation has actually become uh, very exploitative. When reconciliation does happen, which we noted in our report last year or this past year, it is because Indigenous people fought for it tooth and nail. And so we're fighting for this very, for this very, um, for this very process that actually in turn begins and continues to exploit and tokenize us. And I think that there is a real injustice as well as an, as an indigenous person as well. Um, and so with our analysis each year, we hope that we can give some insight into what needs to happen to make reconciliation more meaningful to indigenous peoples, not just a performance to assuage the guilt of settlers. Um, with that, I think that kind of concludes my talk my part of the talk, if you want to learn more, please visit yellowheadinstitute.org slash TRC where you can find all of our past uh, TRC resources, infographics, and just again, um, thank you so much to everyone on the panel for, uh, for having us here. And Ian, if you have any last words, otherwise uh, we'll hand it over to Melissa. No, you, you captured it beautifully. So thank you so much everyone for listening. Wonderful. Thank you. What a great, great talk and great panel. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm hoping to get maybe the panelists talking to each other, but a few things have been raised in the chat that perhaps we could
talk about, and I think Eva just touched on this, like the connection between um, sort of working to hold government accountable um, and then and then that being a sort of system in itself that continually you're banging your head against versus um, what Darcy has brought up in the chat in terms of working um, as sovereign nations with, um, you know, First Nations, Métis and Inuit governance structures and working um, in those ways to, um, you know, with, within. So I, I think it's sort of the perennial kind of question that comes up and I wonder what the panelists might have to say about that. So the question being like around focusing on getting governments to move on things versus um, I guess, demanding decolonization and focus on on um like individual communities and what what you can do as first nations maintain inuit peoples together not that those are separate but i know that's kind of a perennial discussion so any of the I, panelists we have welcome your answers if i may say something i just wanted to mention um when I think about reconciliation, uh, it, you know, it's, it's become so bogged down with these definitions of, of reconciliation between Indigenous peoples and settlers. But what it really means is returning to a relationship that was once very, you know, that was once a good relationship. And I want to uh, gesture to Rachel Flowers, uh, who has written about this before in Indigenous Women's Rage as well as David McDonald, who has mentioned this as well, that reconciliation, I think as an Anishinaabe person, I wanna focus my reconciliation with my language, with my land, with my peoples, with my community. Reconciliation for me means reconciling within my own, um, within my own context as an Anishinaabe person. And until I have, until I can really do that meaningfully, and um, so I really agree with what Darcy's saying here is that we're talking about going back and using and gift the gifts that we've been that we've received as as you know as me as an Anishinaabe person, but Indigenous peoples more broadly, um, and using our own structures that were gifted to each of us, as they say. Um, I think that for me is a very meaningful process that I want to turn my attention to and I want to put my efforts to. Uh, where I think Canadians also need to reconcile too, but they need to reconcile with themselves. Like um, Dr. Malloy had mentioned about reconciling with your own paternalistic attitudes, reconciling with what it means to come from, I gotta say, a culture that is steeped in white supremacy and Eurocentricism. Um, what does that mean? I, and that, I don't know how much that has to do with me or how much I have to you know, hold folks' hands through that because it's a lot of burden to put on you know, people who have, experience the violence of those systems. Um, so I just want to say to me, Glitch Darcy, for, for pointing that out. Just in a kind of a related point, um, I can't stop thinking that just a few blocks away from me, the Prince and uh, Camilla are walking around town. And we're getting lots of coverage about what she's wearing and what they're saying and that they're here to listen to Indigenous peoples and to their credit, they've centered reconciliation. But um, there's been talk about things like apologies, but for me, apologies are, only, are not meaningful when you have to ask for them. Um, apologies are really best done in change behavior. Uh, you change your behavior because you've learned what you did was wrong and then you don't do it again. And then only after you've done that, should you ask for an apology. Um, I see people talking about even the doctrine of discovery, uh, but that can be done in such a performative way where you just get rid of this, say, yeah, no, we don't agree with it, but you continue to double down on uh, the breaching of treaty and land rights in Canada. Um, I, I said this morning in an interview, someone said, well, you know, how do you feel about the prince coming along? And I said, you know, I, the, and his statement about wanting to listen to Indigenous people, I said, I want to listen to him. What records does the royal, the British crown have? What records does the queen is the supreme governor the, of the Church of England, the Anglican Church, who ran so many of these schools? What records do they have? they should be turning this stuff over and undergoing a process. And frankly, I think 
The French government is even worse at this. And in Quebec, where there's almost complete denial about France's colonial role in Canada. So these are things that I think that need to be kind of better conversations because this healing narrative on Indigenous peoples is really unhelpful. It foists the work back on us. What we need to be talking about is justice. And that justice is for the perpetrators and the systems that support them in that role. And that's the important work to be done. But there's also another element, and I don't know um, if others on the panel feel this way, but I think part of it is, uh, is setting ourselves free as First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. The important work of kind of reclaiming who we are and reclaiming our own power. And that means uh, that we have to um, see past the possibilities, uh, the limitations that we feel so often on our own actions uh, when it comes to pushing back or really uplifting ourselves. And that's important work in the conversation that is happening, but I think it deserves, as Eva says, even more centering in the conversation. Because Canada, uh, there, to me, when you're negotiating self-government, you have already lost. Because self-government is something you, you affirm. It's not something that you negotiate, so to speak. You gotta affirm it first, then, then you can figure out the technicalities with the other governments later. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And Thank you, Eva, for your answers. Um, let's see, I have some other question. Right, I guess there's a big question about the take on Bill C-92. Um, there's also a question around child and family services from Kim. Um, what did true real partnership look like for the future of the betterment of the policy and procedures for nations who are in developing their own child welfare policy and procedures? If you want to tackle that, Cindy. So one of the first questions to ask yourself, it kind of gets back to this declaring yourself free piece, is what are your traditional laws regarding children? Because I've had the privilege of working with First Nations communities, not only in Canada, but around the globe. I don't ask, what is your child welfare law? I say, what are your traditional laws around children? And it turns out nobody had a child welfare law so far. So when you're negotiating, quote, self-determination in a child welfare law, then you need to think critically about whether that's actually self-determination. Because what Canada is saying in C92 is you get to negotiate a firm self-determination within this framework, and which kind of gets to John's earlier point. Here is the land we put for you, and you can be free within it. Um, and the other limitation of C92 is that Canada is now saying that they're only funding on reserve. They're not funding off reserve. So 72% uh, of children are off reserve. So it's unclear what happens there. And uh, Canada is also not, um, is saying that, yeah, we know about the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal and all the orders against us, but they don't apply as soon as you sign your own law. Leaving open the question, like the, it's always the, you can have the jurisdiction now, but the funding will come later. That's always a trap. Uh, jurisdiction is the authority to do something, but the funding is the mechanism to do it. And what I find troubling with Canada's conduct right now is they're passing all kinds of laws or interested in all kinds of laws on health, on child welfare, on justice, the big ticket items on the expense side of their balance sheet. They're not talking about passing self-determination laws in resource management or in lands or any of that other stuff. And so it feels like that we just need to ask ourselves these, these really critical questions before we go into these spaces. I am a big believer in uh, self-determination, but I think we need to really authentically claim what that looks like for each nation and make sure that there's adequate resources to support it now and into the future. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I guess one last question here. We have time for one last question. Ramona, um, a BSW student is asking, 
Um, it's coming from Treaty 8 territory in Big Stone Cree Nation. Um, we're in the progress in our ground search of the two residential schools built here in Northern Alberta. We do not have any healing centers or homeless centers or treatment centers um, built there yet. Um, so the question is, what do you think I should do as a, or could do as a BSW student to guide leadership to bring in this uh, needed infrastructure? How could, um, how could Ramona be a voice for those needs? Uh, and any, any, anybody with experience in this would be great. I think everyone should take a crack at that one. And uh, maybe we can start with Eva and Ian around the TRC's calls to action that speak to that and then move to John and Amber and then I'll, I can finish it all. Yeah, I think it's, um, hmm. It's a really good question, Ramona. Um, being a member of the nation and wanting to advocate uh, for change in your community. Um, I, you know, I worked for my community for my First Nation for a few years, uh, about four, four and a half years, I believe I worked for my uh, community. And I was always surprised, maybe not surprised, but reflective of uh, reflecting on um, maybe how much power a community member actually uh, that really has, at least in my community. I was really amazed. And I always thought to myself, um, I, I think there's there's a misconception in, in some First Nations communities anyway, because they're all different, but at least in my experience, there was a misconception on the part of, of community members that they couldn't really um, make any changes unless they were in administration or on council. And uh, maybe it was just my particular First Nation that we moved toward a, uh, a community engagement or, or requiring community engagement to do any kind of strategic planning in our First Nations. But I was always amazed at how much uh, weight a, a community member's voice had. Um, so I, I don't want to take up too much time because we only have a few a few moments, but if I can just encourage you as a community member um, in organizing and looking at how community movements have been organized, um, perhaps in your in your neighboring First Nations as well, um, and how to uh, how to mobilize um, something like that and just petitioning, maybe it starts by going to a council meeting and and putting getting on the agenda and asking about it. Um, it's really it can be really powerful. Oh, sorry, anybody else want to contribute to answer this? I think that's great, great, uh, great answer, Eva. Um, I I'll think- I'll do it a little bit. Uh, oh, just... sorry, yes. Not, Amber, did you want to make a contribution on it? Yeah, I, I was, because it, it's such a, it's a really big question, right? So it's something, um, and I agree with, with Eva completely, you know, um, getting out there and starting to talk to the community is, is the first step, right? So, and it's and the, the problem is it, it's a very traumatic situation as well because um, it's never gonna be easy um, looking in the ground for, for unmarked graves and finding unmarked graves. So that's something that has to be dealt with as well um, for that community. So I, yes, I agree. I totally, I, I mean, it's, a, it's like my mom always says, you know, um, you, if you got an elephant, you take it one bite at it. If you got to eat an elephant, you take it one bite at a time. So you don't become so overwhelmed by um, everything that goes into the in, into place. So that's my my mother's advice to that uh, situation. Works for theses too. So that's what she told me 10 years ago. <laughs> and it did work. <clears throat> um one of the things I would I, I think is really important is to, to stress the lack of preparation that communities have uh, in terms of this. And uh, the, the Canada has been really short on uh, providing funding, in my view. They, they've done some money for the ground survey, but not about the work, the important work that needs to be done. And I really look at uh, Chief Casimir in Tecamloops, who's done an excellent job of that. And so I would actually reach out to that community to find out how they're doing and what are some of the lessons learned. And then on the advocacy front, I agree with Eva, is take some of the solutions to the council and say that this is the type of thing that you could be doing. 
uh, as a learning exercise. And in terms of the government of Canada, I think it's really important that you as a community member and others in the community write to the prime minister. I, I forget about the line ministers and let them know what the impacts are and what the community needs. I do a whole, you can go onto YouTube. I do a lecture on uh, how to do advocacy, like kind of like the, how we did in the CHRT. So you can, it's called mosquito advocacy. So just Google me and mosquito advocacy and you'll find out some of the strategies we use that are free and are meant for small groups who are taking on big organizations like the government of Canada on principle-based things and how you win. Because it seems so unfair to me that Canada is not providing the types of community supports to help communities go through this process. It really, it's not enough to show up and just, uh, you know, uh, do a ceremony or visit or listen to the stories. They have to actually invest in those types of structures you're talking about that are going to be here, not just for next week, but for three, four years down the line, as this work continues, trying to match children to their families and the reunification around that and the truth telling around that. So I I'm really excited that you're well, you're, you've got your sleeves rolled up and you're ready to work and you're already doing work. So good for you. Great. Okay, I think we'll need to end it there and let all our speakers go and get on with their day. Thank you everyone for speaking today. It was, um, was an honor to have you here and thank you for everybody who joined us. And we will email everyone with the video link afterwards and please please share it. And thank you again. <laughs>